Man, I am so excited that you have chosen to join with us on this Easter Sunday. Easter is a time when Christians come together and we recognize and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen? Amen. And so in, in, in this Easter moment, one of the things that churches often say is, he is risen, and then the congregation responds with, he is risen indeed. So he is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Man, what a joy and delight for us to experience life in light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. On Friday, Good Friday, what we observe is the death of Jesus Christ on the cross who suffered and died, taking upon himself bodily the penalty and the punishment for your sin and mine. And so Jesus who died, who entered into the grave, has raised and we come here together today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And as we consider the resurrection of Jesus, a question that is in a lot of our minds is, listen, I understand that Christ died for me, that in dying, he opened a way for me to come to God, but my reality right now, how I feel right now, is set apart, is far from God, and I feel like that on the basis of very real failures in my life. I feel like that because of not only very real failures in my life, but I feel like that because of the reminders of those failures by people in my life or the very real reminder of those failures from people who have removed themselves from my life. So in some sense, the reality that you experience today, it is more true for you that you are a failure than it is true for you or that Christ died for your sins because that failure feels to you what it is to be set apart, to have received the ostracism in your mind from God and the ostracism in your life from the people of your life. What I want us to experience today is an answer to the question of what then has God done to address my failures, and how does he delight, how does he call me to walk in light of my failures? This morning, we're going to start that pursuit to seek to answer that question in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. Listen, if you're here today and you have a paper copy of God's Word, somebody gave it to you recently and you're not familiar with how to use it, or maybe you just don't get it out often and, and you don't know where the books of the Bible are, you can find a table of contents at the front. Luke is in the New Testament. The table of contents is going to let you know where to find it. And as we make our way through today, just know that the large numbers in your Bible are chapters and the small numbers are verses. When you've got it, somebody all got it? Got it. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's read. Luke records and says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow on this day until you deny me three times that you know me. Would you pray with me? God, we come into this place, and for some of us, The words of Jesus to Peter that he's going to deny him three times, that's the testimony of our lives. Three was just a good start for us. Our lives are lived in the ever-present reminder of our failures. Our lives are lived in the ever-present reminder of when people have called us a disappointment, when they have walked out on us, when they have closed themselves off to us. God, I pray that you would give us a hope and a path to walk founded in the promise of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Him who died has been raised. In raising, he calls us to newness of life, and he calls us to follow him and to do so faithfully. So God, I pray for our encouragement. Father, I just want to pray for those in this room, in this hearing, who do not know your son Jesus. That for whatever reason, they're here this morning. They're curious, they're angry, they're frustrated. They're satisfying a friend, a mom, a neighbor. 
that this morning that you would confront them with the truth of your word, their need for a savior, and that you would call them to know him and that they might be saved by him. Father, we want to pray for the other churches in our community. We're so excited to be able to worship Jesus today on Easter Sunday, and we pray for them that as they've been prepping, as they've been working hard this week, making things ready, getting things sorted, reaching out, coordinating events, God, that you would so incredibly bless them in this time. We pray for their staffs, pray for their pastors. God, we're thankful that you allow us to be co-laborers alongside the other churches of our, in our community. And we pray for your good work in their midst this morning. God, would you move freely in this place? Would you call us to know you, to love you, to, to submit ourselves to you in all things? In Christ's name, amen. So Easter, we look at the resurrection, but prior to the resurrection, prior to the death of Jesus on the cross, prior to his mockery, his trial, his beating, the abuse that he faced, prior to this time when Christ gathered with the disciples and was betrayed by one of his own with the kiss of Judas, Jesus gathered in an upper room with the disciples. As he gathered in that upper room, as John 13 records, he's there and he washes the disciples' feet. And, and really what they're meant to do, really the reason they gather is to commemorate God's rescue of his chosen people, his rescue of Israel. Israel was in slavery in Egypt and God sent Moses to deliver his people. And when he ransomed, when he delivered his people from Egypt, he established a meal in remembrance of the good thing that he's done, and that's referred to as the Passover meal. So Jesus is there with the disciples. They're breaking bread. They're drinking the wine together. And as they're in this moment, what he's doing is preparing their hearts and minds for a life lived without a physical Jesus for them to follow. And in this moment, he has the disciples. He knows what's coming. He knows the betrayal. He knows the difficulties. He knows the despair they're going to feel. And so Jesus, as we pick up here in verse 31, he turns and his gaze is on all of the disciples and his reference is to all the disciples, but he speaks directly to one disciple. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, and he's speaking to all of them, that he might sift you, and again, he's speaking to all of them like wheat. So Satan is there, pictured much like he was in the book of Job. He's before God. And, and what Satan wants is the life, the character, the reputation of all the disciples. Satan's demand before God is, give them to me, I'll destroy them. I want their lives ruined. I want their faith in shambles. I want their character destroyed. I want you left, Jesus, with no one to follow you, with no one left to take up and take your message and to spread it. I want to sift them like wheat. And in this moment, under the demand of Satan, under his guise and under his evil, what Jesus does is he turns directly. He locks eyes with Peter. And to Peter, he says these words, but I have prayed that your faith, Peter, your faith may not fail. Jesus' prayer for Peter is not that he wouldn't misstep. It's not that he wouldn't mess up. It's not that he wouldn't make mistakes. It's not that he wouldn't feel the sting of despair. It's not that he wouldn't have any type of stumble. Jesus' prayer for Peter is that his faith would persevere. His faith would stay strong. His faith, even in the midst of significant missteps, even in the midst of being recorded as one who would deny, even in the midst of all these things, that Peter's faith would hold fast. Jesus' intercession for Peter is meant to instill courage in Peter. That the difficulties he was preparing to face, that the difficulties of his life, that the difficulties of the coming hours would not overwhelm and completely set the course and the trajectory of his life. I have prayed that your faith will not fail. Now listen to what he says next. He says, when you have turned again, when you have repented, when you have recovered, when you are ready again, strengthen your 
brothers. The demand of Satan is for all of the disciples. But the prayer Jesus prays on behalf of the disciples runs through Peter. Your brothers, the other 10 need you. So when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, Peter hears this, and it blows his mind. Pete's there, and he's going to track him with Jesus. Uh Uh-huh, Satan. Uh Uh-huh, sift me like wheat. Uh Uh-huh, oh, I got him. I got his number, Jesus. Thanks for that. When I've turned again, hold on a second. I can't turn if I don't fail. I ain't failing. Jesus' word to Peter is meant to be one of encouragement. What Peter responds with is bravado. He says, no, no, Jesus, don't worry about this. Listen, I got this. I'm going to go with you all the way to prison. I'm going to go with you to death. And he's confident. There's no lack of confidence. There's no lack of assurance. There's no lack of uh, impressiveness feeling that the other disciples are meant to have for Peter. I'm going to do all of these things. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to be by your side. Jesus responds and says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times. Jesus' word to Peter meant to bolster his heart in the moment of despair. So from the upper room, Jesus takes the disciples. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. They gather together. Jesus prays his intercession before God, that God would strengthen him, that God would help him to fulfill God's will. The disciples all tuckered out, exhausted, keep falling asleep. Jesus continues to wake them up. Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. The disciples wash, rinse, and repeat, fall asleep, fall asleep, fall asleep. All of a sudden, the moment is there. Judas, one of the 12, comes with the religious leaders. He comes with clubs and swords and torches, and they come to Jesus. Judas, in that moment, kisses Jesus' cheek, betrays his Savior, his Master, his Lord, for 30 pieces of silver. The disciples don't know what to do in that moment. Peter's never good in the moment, quickly wields a sword, cuts off the priest's ear. All the disciples scatter. The one they followed for three years, the one they put their faith and trust in, the Messiah, the chosen one, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, arrested, taken into custody, and the disciples scatter. So there Jesus is. He's in the middle of the huddle, men with with clubs, with swords, with torches. They're taking Jesus, and they're moving away from where the disciples once stood. Peter maintaining a safe distance so as to be able to follow Jesus to prison, to follow Jesus to death, but not to get caught up in the hubbub of all these things, begins to move along slowly to find himself following Jesus, but yet following Jesus at a safe distance. When we get to verse 54 in the same chapter, we find that they have arrived at the priest's house. Peter following at a distance in verse 55 says, and when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. So Peter's in this place, Jesus is in the house, Peter's in the courtyard, and he sits there and he begins to recognize he's cold and he's shivering, his nerves, his adrenaline is at an all time high. And so feeling the warmth of the fire, wanting to get closer to Jesus, he draws in close and he begins to sit. He begins to experience the warmth. He begins to experience his adrenaline calm down. He begins to feel his heart regulate and his pulse slow down. But then it's arrested with the innocent voice of a servant girl. Verse 56 says, Then a servant girl, seeing him, sat in the light and looking closely at him. She peered at him. She gazed at him. She said, This man also was with him. She recognizes Peter. She recognizes him as one who followed Jesus. She recognizes him as one who had been around Jesus. This this man, this one also. It says, But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. See, Peter's response isn't just, I don't know him. I don't know his middle name. I don't know his social. I don't know pertinent details of his life. Peter's response when he says, I do not know him, what he responds is, I know absolutely nothing about him. 
You mentioned this man that I'm part of his group, that I know him, that I'm intimately involved and connected with him. I don't know anything about him. I was out here at night, I was cold, there was a fire, I drew near, and now you're accusing me of being associated with somebody I've never even heard of. Quickly, I do not know him. A little bit later, someone else saw him and said, you are one of them. Peter's response, I am not. He denies knowing anything about Jesus when association is cast upon him that he was one of Christ's disciples, that he was one of them, one of those people who would follow him around, one of those people who was there with Jesus when he performed miracles, one of those people who was there with Jesus when he opposed the religious leaders. Peter's response in the middle of all these things, I am not. He has no idea who Jesus is, and he wants no affiliation with Christ's disciples. Peter's heart beating out of his chest. He's overcome with this sense of what do I do? How do I engage in this? His adrenaline coursing through his veins. But what he gets is an hour of calm. It's going to be okay. This moment seems to have gone. It's going to be okay. Nobody's continuing to quiz me. Everything is okay. Verse 59 says, after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man was also with them, for he is a Galilean. Something about Peter's accent gave him away. Something about his cadence, something about the way he put words together, something about the way he engaged. This guy's one. Luke sanitizes it, but the Gospel of Mark tells us that Peter began to call down curses. So insistent was he that he had no affiliation with Jesus. So insistent was he, so determined was he to argue for his innocence and to maintain his safety. He said, I don't even know what you're talking about. In essence, his response says, listen, the things you're saying about me are so ludicrous, they're so crazy, I I don't even know how to respond. I don't know what you're talking about. It's denying knowing him. It's denying being associated with him. He asks them to question even the legitimacy of their line of questioning. I don't even know what you're talking about. And in an instant, In fact, the text tells us in that moment, even as he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. The words traveling out of Peter's mouth, he hears in the distance the crowing of the rooster. And in that moment, Luke records, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I want us to be in that moment with him. He's responding, and as he responded, as he responds, he hears in the distance the rooster. And maybe what he did was he turned to see where it was coming from, and as he did, his eyes locked with Christ. And seeing Jesus and knowing that Jesus saw him in his moment of failure, his moment of desertion, the moment where he was proved to be a hypocrite. The moment in his mind where he was proved to be unworthy to follow Jesus. And all of these things coalescing. It says, Peter remembered the saying of the Lord and how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. He went out and he wept bitterly. This is the place so many of us stay. We came to faith in Jesus. We put our hope and trust in him. And somewhere along the way, we began to recognize that we were making a series of decisions that it feels like to us that we could never come back from. We're addicted to alcohol. We're addicted to drugs. We spent time in prison. 
We engaged in an affair. We ended up divorced. We destroyed our families. We developed a reputation of being a person who is just pathologically good. And in that goodness, you began to wear the shackles of hypocrisy because you knew in your heart that you were a sinner. But you can't stand the way it feels that other people would know that as well. And when you reflect upon that and you reflect upon your failure and you reflect upon your struggle, what you want to do is to join with Peter and to weep bitterly. Because it feels like to you that failure is all there is. And that there is no return for you from failure. So Peter leaves. He skips out. He weeps bitterly. He runs away. Jesus is taken. He's mocked. He's beaten. He's abused. The kangaroo court rushes him through from leader to leader to leader. The people who once cried out, Hosanna to the Son of God, Hosanna in the highest, now, now cry out in choral response, crucify. It was more desirous for them to take a murderer, to take a man who led an insurrection, than to take the Son of God to see him set free. So they cry out, they chant all in one accord, crucify the Son of God. He's beaten, he's mocked, a crown of thorns upon his head. He's marched up the hill, he's hung in the cross, nails in his hands and feet. He is crucified and hung until he dies. Dying in the cross, his body is placed in the tomb. And being placed in the tomb, three days later, God raises him from the dead. Christ has been resurrected. Christ lives. He appears to the disciples. But in Peter's heart, he feels like a failure. The resurrection is true. Death has been defeated. Sin has been defeated. But what is there for Peter? What is there to help him overcome his failures? I believe John wants us to see in the end of the gospel of John in chapter 21, John records a conversation between Peter and Jesus. John chapter 21 opens up and we see Jesus standing on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. The disciples there with Peter, they didn't know what to do, so they went back to fishing. They've been fishing all night. Jesus is on the shore and he, he cries out, essentially, how's it gone? How's the fishing? They say, yeah, it's not great. We've not caught anything. Jesus tells them, cast their nets on the right side of the boat. When they do that, at that moment, the net fills with fish. Peter, recognizing it's Jesus on the shore, so overcome in this moment, doesn't know what to do, so he puts more clothes on and jumps in the water. He swims to shore. He's there. Everybody else just decided to take the boat. They went just as quickly as Peter did. He's there. He's wringing water out. Jesus, a second time by a fire, this time inviting the disciples to come and sit. So there Peter is. Peter, Jesus, the disciples, a second time, a second fire, this time for Peter's restoration, this time for Peter's healing. Jesus draws near to Simon Peter, and what he says is when they had finished eating breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He says, do you love me more than the other disciples? Do you have in you, in your heart, a love for me that is greater from all of these? Peter in this moment is overcome. His response is simple. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. He can't bring himself to compare his love for the other disciples. All he can respond is with is you know that I love you. So he says to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So he said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus says to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was great. Peter was broken. Peter had denied Jesus three times. And it was in the plan, 
And it was in the purpose of God to restore him three times, once for each of his denials, once for each of his betrayals. Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And so he said to him, Lord, you know everything and you know that I love you. And Jesus calls him once more and says, feed my sheep. Verse 18 says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself to walk wherever you wanted, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you did not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. Do you remember Peter in the upper room? He says, I'll go with you to prison and to death. Here Jesus shows the path Peter has so boldly declared is the path indeed he will follow. He denied him three times. I do not know him. I have no part of his group. I don't know what you're talking about. And to each one of these hurts, to each one of these betrayals, to each one of these failures, Jesus drew close. Do you love me? Because you love me, feed my lambs. Because you love me, tend my flock. Because you love me, feed my lambs. Peter on the cusp of being restored, what he needed from Jesus at this moment was to know that he was still wanted and that he was still needed. So he restores him three times. And then Jesus turns to Peter, and with the words he used to call him at the beginning of his ministry, now he uses those same words to send him, and he says, follow me. You see, what Peter needed to recognize is that God's plans for Peter were on the far side of his failure, and that his provision for Peter went ahead of his rebellion. So Jesus is there in the upper room, and his plans for Peter were that Peter would be there to strengthen his brothers. His plans for Peter were Pentecost, preaching to the thousands. His plans for Peter upon this rock that I will build my church is that our faith would follow in kind of Peter. His plans for Peter were on the far side of his failure. And in the sovereignty of God, God working such delicate fabric, spinning time, moving circumstances, do you recognize even that in Peter's denial, there beside a charcoal fire, he had an opportunity to deny Christ three times, and what Christ did was he created another fire, he created another event, he created another encounter with the living God that he might restore him once for each of his failures. God's love for Peter was so pronounced He didn't want him to be able to escape it. He wanted Peter to recognize that his plans for him, his use for him, his determination for him, his purpose for the kingdom was on the far side of his failures. And so he made a provision for Peter. He made a provision for Peter. He made a way for Peter. He made a course for Peter that went ahead of his rebellion. And in this plan and in this purpose, people beloved by God, the failures you have engaged in, all the various ways you feel judged, all the various ways you feel unloved, all the various ways you feel unworthy, recognize this, that God's purpose for you, his plan for you, his use for you in your family, in this church, in this community, in this world, your neighbor who desperately needs to hear the story of your failure so that they might be encouraged, so that they might recognize that God uses failures. He doesn't use perfect people so that God might hear, he might see you follow him, that the provision he planned for you in the person of Jesus might create a way for you, might create an invite for you. He was there for you in your failure, in your lying, in your cheating, in your adultering, in your waywardness, and in your addiction. The plan for you and the purposes of God was on the far side of your failure. 
and his provision for you was in spite of your rebellion. In fact, it went ahead of your rebellion. This is the love God has for you. And as we hear this, as the people of God, Listen, as the, as the band and the choir begin to make their way up, as the people of God, we must recognize God's love for us. His care for us. Too many of us have placed our faith and trust in Jesus, and we have allowed ourselves to be sidelined by our failures. Because when we feel like trying again and when you feel like going to church or when you feel like serving or when you feel like going on a mission trip or when you feel like sharing the gospel or when you feel like doing an act of kindness or charity, what you hear louder than the plan of God is the voice of Satan crying out, I want to sift them like What God wants us to do is to have a radical reorientation of our hearts that reminds us of the salvation we enjoy through the sacrifice of Jesus and to walk in the reality that the plans of God for you were on the far side of your failure. In the provision of God for you went ahead of your rebellion. As the people of God, we must stay true to the promises of God. Listen, some of you are in this place today. You don't know Jesus. You don't even know if you want to know him. Do you know that the plans God has for you, some of those involve you being here today so that you could hear a message of hope and invitation to step into a relationship with a God who sent his son to die for you. That he could take on the penalty and the punishment for your sins and invite you into a relationship with him. Jesus Christ, who we worship as risen, he wants you to know him. He took on the penalty and the punishment for your sin and mine. He is the provision for you. He is your Savior. And He invites you to know Him and to come to Him. So, listen, if that's you this morning and you're weighing on what it would look like to follow Jesus and what it would look like to be saved by Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to have a group of men and women over here underneath the cross, and they would love to talk with you, to pray with you, to share God's love with you, that the God of the universe sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and to be raised for you. He's overcome sin and death and invites you to know him.